Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. Well, welcome to our first ever Chief of Detectives special, which is brought to you by our Chief of Detectives Patreon Fats. As one of our Chief of Detective Patreons, he has the right to request that we play a non-detective special. Now, I will admit, uh, I set up my Patreon more than nine years ago. And this is one of those benefits that no one has taken advantage of before. But we're so happy to do it, particularly this episode. It's a really good one. It's a classic episode of Escape. The original air date is August the 2nd, 1953, and the title is The Red Forest, starring the great William Conrad. Tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of Romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape! Designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are alone in a giant forest, seeking a way of escape, while around you, gaining with your every step, the relentless enemy which is fire, is closing in from every side, until there will be only one way out, and that way is death. So listen now as Escape brings you Antony Ellis' exciting story, The Red Forest. The trail had led from a lumber town along a washboard road and into the forest. I'm no woodsman, but in the daylight, I found the place. And then I started back to the car. But something was different. Maybe the tall shadows. There wasn't a trail anymore. Only streams where there hadn't been before. Trees that were the same, but weren't. And sounds. Sounds that when you were a kid on a hike were fun. (laughs) And now they scared you. I'd thrown my last cigarette away three, four hours before. And that's when the fire had started. And it was then that I started to run. Run. It was nearly dark when I found the road. I'd come to it about a half a mile below where I'd parked my car. A half hour later, on the outskirts of a little town, my headlights picked up a girl standing by the side of the road. She carried a cheap paper suitcase, and she was summing a ride. Sure. Uh, Put your case in the back. Oh, yeah. Uh, Not many cars on the road tonight. No. Been walking long? Uh Uh-huh. On my way to Missoula. My last ride dropped me a mile or so back. Yeah? You live around here? No. 
I don't guess you'd be going as far as Missoula. Sure. Gee, that's swell. I got a job there starting tomorrow. Kind of broke, if you know what I mean. Buses cost money. I know what you mean. Hey, your face. What? You've been hurt. You're all scratched up. Oh, I... I was hunting. I got lost just the other side of town. If, uh... If you want to take a nap, it's okay. We got about a hundred miles to go. Thanks. Um, gee, it's nice out here. Kind of lonely. <laughs> Not much of a road. It smells good. I wonder what that is over there. What? Well, bright, like. See? <laughs> Could almost be Seattle from a long ways off. I had a boyfriend used to take me driving at night. And when we came back, you could see a glow. Just like that. I knew what it was. That glow in the sky. It was on our right. And as the road twisted through the trees, it fell behind us. And then to our left. And then circled until it was straight ahead again. The girl had fallen asleep very quickly. I saw her face in the light from the dash. Thin, pretty, and peaceful. It was about 15 minutes after I'd picked her up that I saw the lights on the road, and then closer, the figures waving. Hey, are we there already? I just got to sleep. No, there's something wrong. There's a cop coming this way. What's the trouble? Plenty. We want you, mister. Wait, you want me? Flyer, bad one. We gotta have every man we can find. We can use her, too. Hey. Oh, well, well, look, I'd, I'd like to. Ro! But okay. Ro's the forest ranger. He'll explain. Oh, look, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm on my way to Missoula. Not tonight, you're not... I've got authority to do this, mister. I'm sorry, but we need you. But I haven't got You couldn't get much farther anyway. The road's cut off. The mountain's gone up like a torch. If it spreads, there's three towns gonna go, too. Come on, I got some clothes and boots for you. Hey, what about me? I gotta get to Missoula. I got a job in the morning. Sorry, sister. You got a job serving coffee here. You cops. Five dollars a day. A day? Or longer. It depends. Let's go. There was nothing else to do, so I got into the clothes the ranger gave me and then stood around and waited. I wasn't tired anymore. Just scared. Scared of going into that forest again. The wind came up a bit, and with it, the smell. Smell of burning. Smell of death. A long way off, but closer than the glow had been, we could see flickering against the sky. And it was in a lot of places. And then suddenly it was too warm and too quiet. All right, you guys. The telephone's burned out. I've made contact with a shortwave set. You, uh, mister, what's your name? Pindell. Pindell. Ever use one of these? What, a walkie-talkie? Yeah, sure, I was in the signal corps. Okay, you'll carry it. Now, listen, this is bad. It's real bad. The fire's got behind us. We can't get any more men through here for several hours. They've got to come around from the other side. That's 30 miles. What's the use, then? Let's get out. Crowbar. Yeah? I'm putting you in charge. You know what to do. Get in as close as you can to the river and set a backfire. Sure. I've got to stick here with the transmitter. I'll let you know what's happening. Sure, you stay here with a pretty girl. We go and get fried. Shut up, Pat. Hanson, you'll have to go with them. Three's not enough. Sure. Well, the cop's going to do some work. You better take along some food and canteens. Now okay, step on it. Hi. Got a couple of sandwiches I made up here. Thanks. This sure is something, isn't it? Yeah. You scared? Scared? Why? Your face is white. You scared? I'm from the city. I know what you mean. Those trees give me the willies, too. Dark. Yeah, sure, that's it. You'll be all right. Listen, kid. If, uh... If anything happens, you take my car. Here, here are the keys. What do you mean? Well, if, if I don't come back... Uh, 
Keep the car. Here's the registration. You kidding? You're coming back. Yeah. Yeah. So long. Hey, my name's Jan. What's yours? Wally. You be careful, Wally. We went into the forest. Men with spades, men against fire and terror. There was the man they called Fat. 300 pounds of ungainly body topped by a tiny and almost disgustingly childlike face. There was Crowbar, a big, dark man, quiet and filled with a knowledge of the woods. Hanson, the state trooper, thin and wiry, his natty, cocky shirt stained with sweat and dirt. And me. We'd gone about a mile when we first heard it. It came in gusts with the wind high above us. Wait a minute. Oh, shut up. Let's get out of here. About three miles, I figure. It's coming fast. We're about that far from the river, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah, listen, you guys. If it's crossed the river, we're sunk. Let's get out. Hey, Wally. Yeah. Get row. Tell him it's coming this way pretty fast. Look. Look, Sparks right. up there. Look, see? Sure, fat Hello. Sparks. Fire. You Hello. chicken. Oh, Leo. Pendel calling row. Pendel calling row. Over. Row. This is row. Over. We're still about three miles from the river. We can hear it. Over. You can't backfire now. The wind's changed. You better come back. Over. Right. He says go back. That's okay with me, boy. Come on. Hey, listen to that. I wanted to run again. That same feeling I'd known before. The fear all around us closing in and down. There was no sky above, only blackness, tinged with red, pressing. And behind, the living forest running, overtaking and passing us. When we reached the road again, the sound was steady. But I had a strange feeling of relief when I saw the forest ranger and the girl, Jan. It was like coming home. I think it was then that I stopped being afraid. Come on, Ro. We can't do no good now. We got to try and join up with the others. Well, what do you mean? The fire's on three sides of us. That means we head southeast. Oh, can we take the road back? No, it's cut off. There's 200 men trying to keep a path open for us. We've got to make five miles and in a hurry. Bad as that? It's worse. If we don't get there in time and they can't make a fire break, we're going to be smack in the middle and there's not going to be any way out. <laughs> We will return to escape in just a moment. Lightning may strike more than once in the same place, but it can't begin to compete with man when it comes to starting forest fires. For one fire caused by lightning, supposedly rational humans cause nine by trifling carelessness with matches, cigarettes, and bonfires. We need our forests for timber, to conserve our water supply, to add beauty to our lives. Let's not burn them up. And now, back to Escape. We didn't carry anything but canteens. It was hot, and because it was hot, it made you thirsty even when you didn't need water. The going was rough, and we could only head in what we thought was the general direction of safety. It was at the ridge that we lost the first man. Wind's changing again, Crowbar. Which way? You can't tell. It's haywire with this fire. Well, do we go straight ahead? Might as well. Wait a minute. You see that ridge? Yeah. Well, I'm going up there. Shouldn't take more than ten minutes. I'll be able to get a better look. Give me the flash. I'll signal to you. I don't know. We haven't got much of a start. The fire's behind us and a lot faster. Better than walking toward it. Remember, it's on three sides. Okay. Make it fast, Crowbar. Sure. Good luck. Thanks. Well, what do we do? Just sit and wait? That's right. But listen. 
You're the ranger. Why don't you go? What you send Crowbar for? He's fought fires before he knows. He's a better man to climb up there. He's faster than me. Yeah, I'll bet. Hi. Oh. You okay, kid? Sure, Wally. It's fine. I guess I'm not used to walking, though. These high heels don't help. Oh, you take it easy. My feet feel like they did once at a dance I went to. Some big lunk climbed all over me. <laughs> I, I guess you won't have that job in Missoula, huh? If I get out of this, that's all I care about. Yeah, it's tough. Hey, Wally. I'm scared. Give me your hand, will you? She held on tight to my hand... It wasn't the darkness that frightened her now. There wasn't darkness anymore, but a yellowish-red light that came from everywhere. It was another kind of fear. Fear of something you could see, hear, and with every minute feel more and more. We waited there ten minutes. Eleven. Twelve. And then... You hear something? Yeah. Seemed to come from over there. From the the ridge, maybe? Maybe. L- listen, you, you think something got crowbar, a lion or something? I'll go up. No. What do you mean, no? No time. We waited too long. Well, now. he may be hurt. I know that, but it'll take you longer than it took crowbar to get there. Come on. No. You couldn't find him in the dark. Who says he's hurt anyway? We'll move on. He'll catch up. I say we go after him. Not me. All right, put it to a vote. Hurry up, Hanson. We go on. Pat? Let's get out of here. And I say go on. That leaves you, miss. I'm staying with Wally. All right. We'll go with you. We never saw Crowbar again. Maybe a lion got him. Maybe he got lost. We never saw him again. The ranger went ahead, finding trails somehow, keeping us moving. We began to climb, and after a while we were on another ridge. And for the first time we could see the fire. It stretched out for miles, like a huge red sea. And it was all around us. Gee, Wally. Yeah, I know, kid. I know. Will it hurt much? I don't know. Take a breather. I'm going to try the walkie-talkie again. He's not scared, is he? I guess not. Is that because he's a ranger or because he's very brave? Jan, you're a funny girl. No, I'm not. Hey. What? Sure. Why did you want me to do that? I don't know. You're a nice fella. I'll miss you. Listen, Jan. I want to tell you something. What? If we get out, well, maybe... Yeah. Look, I, I, I'm all right. I mean, maybe we could have fun together. I know. Well, I did something wrong once. I, I killed a man. Why? He framed me. He got me put away for something I didn't do. We were driving in the east and ran over a woman. He was at the wheel, but he ran off and left me. Well, you didn't do it. That's what I say, but I'd been drinking and went to sleep. When I woke up, I was behind the wheel. He'd put me there. And that's how the cops found me. I got five years. Oh. I was married. I lost my wife, my job, my friends. And I swore I'd get my pal. And I did. He knew I was after him, and he ran. But I caught up with him. I don't care. Don't you? I don't know why I told you that. Maybe because if we do get out... Sure. I know. I know. It's okay. Come on, Pindell. The ranger's moving off. 
It was the state trooper, Hanson. I worried how much he'd heard, but there wasn't time to worry about it then. Ro thought he'd seen a break in the fire and we headed for it. And when we got down in the trees again, I began to get a feeling that I'd been there before. It was nothing I could recognize, but just a feeling. A couple of hundred yards along, I knew why. Hold up. There's a shack. Looks like someone's <laughs> living there. Better have a look. Yeah. Door's open. Hey. It's a man. Give me a hand here. Sure. He's been shot. Yeah, a few hours ago from the looks of it. You think the man who did this might have started it? Well, what do you mean? The fire. Started a few miles north of here. We figured somebody got careless with a match. But maybe it was the killer running away. I'd like to get the fellow who did that. Maybe I will. Me too. Well, we can't do anything here. Come on. From there on, nobody talked. It was hard enough to lift your feet. Jan was nearly through. I have carried her. If Ro knew where he was leading us, he didn't say. We followed and knew that sooner or later we'd stop because we were too tired to go on. Fat was the first. Uh, it's fine. Wait, wait a minute. You've got to go on. There's still a chance. All right. Just for a minute. No. Need Get rest. Up. No, please. One minute. That's all. Get up. No, I can't. I can't. Okay, you stay here. No. No, no! Well, then, come on! I, I tell you, I can't! Well, I'm sorry. Catch up to us. Stay on the train. No, no. Come on, Chan. We're going to leave him. We have to. No! Don't leave me! The fellas are coming! Fellas, please! This way! Can we help him? Oh, we're almost dead oh, ourselves. I can't! Fellas, let me play! My name is free! I don't know whether it was because none of us liked him or because we knew that we couldn't do anything. Funny how you can lose a man and know he's gonna die and you put him out of your mind. Perhaps we wanted to live so badly we figured the fire would take time out from us to attend to fat. Hanson was next. I'm finished. No, you're not. Yeah. Just a little farther to go. We can still get through. No. No, you go ahead. Save the girl. I'm sorry, Hanson. I wish no, we could No, no, go on. Maybe I can catch up. But I, I gotta rest. You, Wally, do me a favor. What? I lost my gun somewhere. You know what I mean. It'll be quicker that way. You, you got one? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Thanks. Uh, one bullet fired, eh? That's what I wanted to know. Okay, Pindell. I've had enough rest. I can keep up with you now. I feel a little safer with this on me. All right, go ahead. I'll walk behind you. He knew. He knew what I'd done. But I didn't care now. It wasn't important anymore. Right now, all I wanted to do was get Jan out of this. What was that? It was behind us. It sounded like Hanson. Come on. Come on, but watch that ravine. He must have fallen. We gotta help him. There's no time. We got to. Oh, he didn't help Fat. Why him? I don't know. Please. All right. All right, stay here. <coughs> Hanson! Hanson! Down here! But keep calling! Here! Over to this way! Over this way! Over here! Okay! Oh, oh my, my leg! Hey, can you get up? It's broken, I guess. 
Yeah. Hanson. Yeah. You know about me, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, I heard you telling the girl. She won't say anything. No. I guess not. The fellow had it coming to him, Hanson. Well, I, I wouldn't know. I'm a cop. Yeah. It's getting hot. Smoke. Yeah. Put your arm over my shoulder. No, oh, you... You can't get me up there. Well, I can try. <laughs> Uh, come on. It's no good. We can't make it. I'll get Roe. I'll come back. No, there's no time. Go on. Get out of here. Well, I... Go on. I've got your gun. Nobody will ever know. That's not sorry. I get get out of here. Somehow I made it up the trail again. I thought I heard a shot. Or maybe it was a burning tree going down. Jan was waiting for me. We caught up with Roe and went on until the trees began to thin out. And we heard the shots of men. But I don't remember anything else because I passed out for a long time. When I woke up, Jan was sitting by my bed and it was cool again. Hi. Jan. Jan, did they get Hanson out? No. No. Listen, Jan, about what I told you back there. You know, the man I killed. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not sorry. I mean, it was all right about him, but not Hanson, Crowbar, and Fat. That was my fault, you know. Yeah. Well, I want you to call the cops. No. Now, listen, I... I've been dreaming about it. It's no good. Now, be a good kid and call the cops. I don't have to. They're outside in the corridor. Now, what do you mean? Rose sent for him. You told what you did while you were unconscious. I told... Oh, that, that's good. That's good. I'm glad. You want me to hang around? Well, I... That's up to you, I guess. I guess it is. I'll hang around. Escape has brought you The Red Forest, written and directed by Anthony Ellis, starring William Conrad as Wally and Georgia Ellis as Jan. Featured in the cast were Parley Bear, John Daner, Jay Novello, and Tom Tully. The special music for Escape was composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week. You are in a lighthouse off the steaming coast of French Guinea, while around you, frightful in its fury, a nightmare of terror and violence is closing in on you, a nightmare from which there is no escape. So listen next week when, by popular request, Escape repeats one of its most unusual stories, Three Skeleton Key by Georges Tudus. <laughs> Those favorites of millions, yours truly, Johnny Dollar and Mr. and Mrs. North, make for highly exciting listening on as Johnny prowls the world for adventure and the Norths meet murder merrily. Now, most of these same stations also bring you 21st Precinct, great stories based on the world's largest police department. Consider this an invitation to excitement and adventure Tuesdays on CBS Radio. This is George Walsh speaking.
And remember, Gene Herschel stars as kindly Dr. Christian every Wednesday evening on the CBS Radio Network. Welcome back. As someone who has lived in the part of the country where this episode is set for nearly all my life, this was a fascinating story because I'm aware of the country where this story occurs. Uh, We've also had a very challenging wildfire season here as I'm recording this that's still ongoing. In fact, today I'm staying indoors as the air quality is really awful around here as a result of fires that are some distance away. Now, I will say in terms of the precise location, I've only taken the road between Idaho and Missoula a few times, and it's been quite a few years since I have. But when I was growing up, we often saw arrows pointing to Missoula, but opted for a route that would take us further northwest to Libby or Kalispell. So this type of country that this is set in is definitely familiar for me. Wildfires are a regular part of life out here. It's just one of those things you deal with if you live in the northeast It's the winters. If you live in Florida, it's the hurricanes. In my part of the country, the wildfires are a recurring event. Uh, Tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of acres has far-reaching effects far beyond the actual zone of the fire. I remember trying to visit Glacier one last time before I left Montana. And even though the park was still open and not in the path of the fire, the smoke was so thick that breathing, let alone driving, uh, was a real challenge there. Even though my current home in West Boise is far away from any fire lines, fires from the edge of the city or hundreds of miles away affect our air quality. The air quality index measures... This with numbers corresponding to condition colors like green for good, yellow for moderate, orange for unhealthy for sensitive groups, and red for unhealthy. The red zone begins at 150, and we've had days where the AQI has gone over 200. On the day I'm recording this, the AQI hit over 190. The smell can be overpowering. I found myself with an irritated throat after taking the trash bins to the curb. The temporary place we're at in the foothills is much closer to the fires and so has even more quality issues, although we're nowhere close to the flames and hopefully we're getting towards the end of fire season so we'll get past this. As difficult as experiencing wildfires can be from a distance, this episode reminds us that's nothing compared to the horror of being trapped within the fire lines. Now this is a very extreme fire. I've never heard of a motorist being conscripted to fight a fire, and I've lived in this part of the country nearly my whole life, including in some of the rural parts of Idaho and Montana. And I've known several people who have regularly gone out and fought wildfires. However, I think some of the inspiration for this story for Anthony Ellis may have come from the Great Fire of 1910, which burned down 3 million acres across three states and led to 87 deaths. 
Firefighting in the West has moved forward both in the level of preparation and the equipment used to fight it. Nevertheless, there's only so much that can be done, and being caught in the midst of these massive fires is a truly horrific experience. And in terms of the conscription, the forest fire is extreme, and Wally's in a situation where the fire is closing in, and he can't retreat from it, so he might as well fight it. There's also a dramatic reason for this, and I don't think it's just because the story couldn't happen if it didn't. Of course, the story's a dramatic tale of survival and battling nature that's gone out of control. But it really does offer some broader themes. And I think part of it lies in the real-life concern that's represented by the mid-episode's PSAs about uh, the importance of fire safety. So much harm is done by the sort of human carelessness that those PSAs target that leads to fires. Things like illegal fireworks, improperly extinguished campfires, and ignoring rules about when burns can occur. And it goes into one of the great paradoxes of the part of the West I live in. We have a very individualistic ethic. I think that most of the people who live out here want to live our own lives as we see fit. And in general, that's where I tend to land. And it's very hard for me to imagine living anywhere else because that's the sort of ethic and approach that I tend to feel most comfortable in. But there are also things that we have to do, basic courtesies that we have to follow in order for this place to be worth living in. And certainly that applies to the rules for preventing forest fires. And I think the vast majority of people, you know, some might read some political statement. I I think, though, the vast majority of people, regardless of party, regardless of anything else, don't want to see this area on fire. And so they do all of the things that are common sense to make sure that it doesn't get set on fire. But then you just have a few folks who just don't care. And they do very stupid things that lead to massive wildfires. And I think in terms of that basic approach, the idea of Wally having to be involved in fighting the fire he started, it is kind of a twist because most of the people who start these fires either don't know be- you know, we're just so careless and out of it, they're not realized what they did. Or they just drive away and nobody ever finds out who did it. But Wally actually has to confront and deal with what he did and to see its effects up close and viscerally and feel it, which does make him face what he did to at least an extent. But there's also a broader message, and I think it ties into his very idea of taking the law into his own hands and seeking vengeance. He thought he could have his own private revenge, that it would only affect him and his deserving target. Yet his act of vengeance has a far wider consequence. The idea of vengeance or anger as a fire is pretty well-established poetic and literary image that is well-realized in the audio drama as Wally's act of vengeance cuts a swath of destruction and death through so many innocents. And the story suggests that's always the case with vengeance, as much as we might wish it were not just individuals whose individual acts have no consequences beyond ourselves and our immediate uh, targets. Rather, we're social beings, and just like in fire, our, our actions always have consequences that ripple out. Now, of course, this is more than its message and theme. It's as you would expect, really well produced, showing the high standards that Escape maintained throughout its run. And a great performance, as always, from William Conrad, whose narration and acting really capture 
all of the intensity and all of the emotions that this story demands. Of course, Conrad really shows some great range in this episode. And he was one of those actors who the vast majority of his radio roles were kind of unremarkable character roles, but he could, when given a chance, just deliver an absolutely unforgettable performance, which is what we get here in this episode. I want to go ahead now and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And of course, since this is his special, I want to go ahead and thank Fats, Patreon supporter since May of 2024. Currently supporting the podcast at the Chief of Detectives level of $30 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support and also for suggesting this episode of Escape. It was really a great episode to listen to and... I enjoyed it. That will actually do it for today. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. We will be back next Sunday with our 4,000th episode special. But join us back here tomorrow for the Adventures of the Falcon, where... You ought to see me do card tricks. Or shall we switch? You insist? I insist. Now, let's see you pour it down. Your health, darling. Drink hot in. Well, I'm still alive. Yeah, I guess I owe you an apology. <laughs> then why not drink to me? No sooner said than done. Here's to a beautiful friendship, June. <laughs> hey, that's pretty potent stuff. A bit of pack squ- <coughs> Why, Mike? What's the trouble? Well, suddenly, I feel dizzy. I... It's your imagination, darling. Why, you little... Waring. Waring. Ah, oh, you poor darling. You poor, poor... I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram. Instagram.com slash Great Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.